At Online Med Ed, we walk you through every topic in detail so you're ready for the boards and the wards. In impulse control disorders, there was some stressor that induced anxiety that then an action alleviated. That was an external force. In OCD and its related disorders, that anxiety-provoking thing comes from within. It's internal. And as you'll see, obsessions induce anxiety and compulsions alleviate it. I want to focus a long time on obsessive compulsive disorder not to be confused with the personality disorder we'll talk about in the personality disorder lesson, but I want to focus on OCD, spend a lot of time on it. If you understand it, you understand all the related disorders, and we'll just go through a quick table on those. Let's start off with OCD. Obsessive compulsive disorder has two main parts. Not surprisingly, the obsessions and the compulsions. The big thing here is that the obsessions are anxiety provoking, whereas the compulsions are anxiety reducing. Think about breathing. You have to breathe. You can choose not to breathe, but eventually you're going to take a breath. That's what obsessive compulsive disorder feels like. The obsession I need air, the compulsion, breathe. Patients can resist the compulsions for a time until the obsessions become so bad and so anxiety provoking that they must do the compulsion. The obsessions are internal and they are intrusive. They're unwanted and anxiety provoking. What they are, are thoughts or preoccupations. There's not necessarily a trigger that sets them off or increases the anxiety, but rather an internal, unwanted, spontaneous need, an anxiety that demands the compulsion be performed. The compulsion is generally a behavior or a ritual. It's just doing something. The act of doing it relieves the anxiety. You're probably thinking of some that you already know about, because there are some that are common, obsessions and the related compulsions. Some common obsessions include safety, and the compulsions that go along with that are gonna be things like lock checking, window checking, turning off the stove over and over and over again, checking to ensure the thing that is provoked, the obsession that's worried about safety is satisfied. Another common one is contamination, being dirty, the compulsion that is going to be washing or cleaning. The last of the common obsessions is going to be symmetry. which leads to putting things into order or counting. Now the compulsion need not be a physical action. It could be simply be a mental ritual, multiplying by five, dividing by three from a thousand, whatever the case may be. It's a repeated, repetitive motion or a common repeated behavior or ritual. Every time the obsession comes, the compulsion is required. And even though it doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, for most patients, they will have one obsession and one compulsion. They'll have anxiety provoking thoughts that are alleviated by some sort of behavior or ritual. These are common, but we'll also see how these relate to the OCD related disorders in a similar fashion. The diagnosis of OCD is clinical. But you might be looking at these and thinking, man, you know, I live in a bad neighborhood. I go check my locks before I leave. I'm pretty tidy. I mean, I, I can't stand to have a workplace where I don't know where my books are. Those behaviors are normal. Right? Making sure your house is safe, washing your hands before and after each patient encounter is good for patient safety, and keeping things in order, well, that's just good habits. If you see the studio, you'll know that I do not have obsessive-compulsive disorder. 
but it becomes a disorder when it impairs function. That's really important. All these things may sound normal, or you might be thinking to yourself, I do that. If you don't feel the need to breathe after holding your breath, you die. If you don't have that sensation within you, you don't have OCD. You might be particular, but when these things cause problems in your life, socially, personally, academically, or at your job, then you have a disorder. The people who check the locks leave late every day because they must check every window and door 15 times. They leave an hour early, but they can't walk out of the door until they fulfill the compulsion 15 times. The person who's washing their hands is not for patient safety. They're washing their hands until their hands bleed. They put things into such particular order that they stack them over and over and over again, and being off by a millimeter makes them do it all over again. This is a anxiety-inducing thought that they don't want, they will seek help, because they do these compulsions, these rituals, in order to alleviate that anxiety. And the way you treat them, and I want you to see the correlate, because this is a chronic disease, it correlates well with the therapy for generalized anxiety disorder. Psychotherapy is almost always the best response, and should be on the test, which is better than medications. Because it's chronic, you're going to use cognitive behavioral therapy, desensitization most often, where you simply control the anxiety with medications, and then you give them the stimulus, the obsession, and because there's a breaking of the anxiety, to the thought of the obsession, they don't, they don't feel compelled to do the compulsion. Or you can redirect the compulsion to something innocuous, like elastic band snapping or snapping your fingers, rather than going through your entire house and checking every window again. Because it's a chronic anxiety disease, disorder, you're going to choose SSRIs. Much in the same vein as we learned in the anxiety disorder lecture for generalized anxiety disorder. And because benzos are habit forming, and this is a chronic disease, you generally don't want to use benzodiazepines unless they also suffer from panic attacks, in which case you use the benzos for panic attacks only, not for chronic management of OCD. If you understand this part of the lesson, you're gold. Let's talk about some of the related disorders in terms of the disorder itself. What the preoccupation is, or the obsession, what the compulsion ends up being, and what effect that has on the patient. The first one is hoarding disorder. The person fears or gets anxiety over throwing away anything. Throwing things away. They are unable to throw things away. They are compelled by an internal thought that they don't want to keep those items. Usually these things are trash. Right? Hoarding gold bars in your safe in the basement is just a good idea if you can afford gold bars. But if you've got garbage and trash and kitty litter and newspapers stacked up all around the house because you can't get rid of them, well, that creates an unsafe environment. If you end up hoarding animals, it also becomes unsanitary. The problem with hoarding disorder is that it often goes unnoticed because the person has all their stuff in their private home. No one notices until someone goes there. And generally, the anxiety is known, they're seeking help, and if someone can hide hoarding disorder by never inviting anyone over. But you want to get them, on, get them help to so get their living environment back into shape so they don't fall or live with unsanitary conditions. The next two are sort of the same disease, but I'm going to talk about them as completely separate disorders that have very specific demographics. Of course, they're intermixed, but I want you to learn them completely separately. That is body dysmorphic disorder, which is going to be female disease, and its equivalent muscle dysphoria is going to be the male disease. Can women have muscle dysphoria and men body dysmorphic disorder? Of course. 
but learn them as gender specific because that's probably how they're going to show up on the test. Muscle dysphoria will go first because it's gaining a lot of attention in the press in the last couple of years, which means it's likely to show up on your exam. Muscle dysphoria disorder has a preoccupation with getting swole, that is, increasing the muscle size. In order to do that, these guys are going to perform excessive exercise. and use anabolic steroids. Now you ask competitive bodybuilders, how are they gonna win? They're using steroids. But for the test, and as we'll talk again for body dysmorphic disorder, for the test, if you're confused whether this person is a competitive athlete on the br brink of winning, or it's a disorder, on your medical licensing exam test, it's a disorder. Most people are not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Most people are not in this to compete to win the world championship. Most people who are doing this to themselves are likely trying to chase something that they cannot achieve, and it's not because they want to be a champion. It's because they have body dysmorphic disorder in the way, in the way of muscle dysphoria. But in real life, both body dysmorphic and muscle dysphoria are very hard to separate from someone who's just attempting to be a competitive athlete, working out hard to improve their body, their speed, their agility, whatever, to look better. Someone who cares about their looks so works hard so that they look good. On the test, it's about dysfunction. So if somebody is dropping into the use of anabolic steroids, leading to rhabdo, which in turn can lead to acute renal failure, or going on violent sprees in the way of roid rage, that person is not doing a good job. They don't have a champion physique. They have disorder. And if you have anything about a psychiatry question regarding copper or testicular atrophy, what they're getting at is anabolic steroid use, muscle dysphoria on the test, anything, copper disorder, atrophy of testicles, muscle dysphoria, unless it's Wilson's disease. It wouldn't be a psychiatry question. The equivalent in women is body dysmorphic disorder, and this diagnosis really has not changed from DSM-4 to 5. It is going to be a preoccupation with some part of the body, and it is often going to be some part of the body that is usually associated with beauty or attractiveness. Skin, hair, nose, breast. These women are going to be preoccupied with the fact that they don't look good, that something's wrong, asymmetry. It's an ugly body part, even though it's relatively normal. They will be compelled to check their appearance. And they may even end up with unnecessary surgeries. Now the risk is not nearly as bad as anabolic steroid use. And it becomes much more relevant to identify these patients if you're going to become a surgeon. They may come to a plastic surgeon to alter their body so that they feel better about themselves because something is broken. It's up to the surgeon to decide, will this actually make her feel better? Or does she have body dysmorphic disorder? There's nothing wrong with the body part she wants to change and doing surgery is only going to harm her. The last disorder is included in the DSM-5 in this section, even though it doesn't quite meet, is trichotillomania. There's no one preoccupation. It's sort of anything. It's more of a general anxiety issue. But they put it on this section because it often comes up on the test because of its associations. The compulsion is to pull out hair which is going to lead to alopecia. The thing is, on Monday, she pulls out her hair on the right side, on Wednesday, the left, on Saturday, the back, which means that she's pulling out hair from different sections of her head at different times. So she's gonna get hair thinning, which looks like alopecia, but all the hairs, because they're growing at the same time, but she's pulling them out at different times, will be in varying lengths. 
what you need to do for this, because it's alopecia, is rule out fungus. If you fail to rule out fungus, she loses her hair. That's no good. And the big association with the boards is the bezoar. In a variant where she pulls out her hair and eats it, can lead to a small bowel obstruction. Again, most of the emphasis was on obsessive compulsive disorder, understanding what an obsession is, internal thought, unwanted, intrusive, intense anxiety, like trying to hold your breath, and the compulsion which reduces the anxiety, a ritual or behavior, taking the breath, recognizing that most patients have one obsession that's linked with one compulsion, and it's a problem when it leads to impairment of function in any element of life, because it's chronic, Psychotherapy with cognitive behavioral therapy, particularly desensitization and control with SSRIs, is key. Then be able to separate out the different disorders that are related to OCD. Hoarding is keeping a bunch of stuff in your house. Body dysmorphic disorder is preoccupation with one body part being ugly, even though it's not, leading to checking of appearances. Muscle dysphoria, dudes who use steroids to get swole, and trichotillomania, women who pull out their hair, alopecia in varying lengths. That is OCD and its related disorders.